God has revealed to us the secrets of the universe in the language of mathematics. And the wow. question comes up, is there a connection between belief in God and doing science? Men became scientific because they expected law in nature, because they believed in a lawgiver. What it narrows down to is the very interesting fact that mathematics works. John Lennox explains why math points to God and it's absolutely fascinating. So let's get right into it. Shout out to John Lennox and... So the idea that you were fascinated by math and wanted to pursue math uh, is something, but what was it that made you want to fit math into science? I mean, because there, I, I would guess that most mathematicians don't leap into the world of science. You've leapt uh, rather fully into that world and you've not left your math behind. But what was it that pushed you to, to, to be inquisitive about science from the position of a mathematician? Well, I think it involves Christianity in a very profound way because mm. I hadn't been studying mathematics long. Now I'm talking about being a teenager now, long before I got to Cambridge. I, I'm a teenager and I'm reading and I discover statements like Kepler's statements that God has revealed to us the secrets of the universe, something like that, in the language of mathematics. Wow. And I discovered pretty early on through my reading, actually of C.S. Lewis, because C.S. Lewis was a literary genius, but he understood in a way that some scientists don't, the big issues that arose. And he made a statement in one of his books and it really stuck with me. And I've used it all my life and I'm gonna use it now. He looks back at the origin of modern science it arose in the 16th and 17th centuries with people like Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. Let's just stick with those three. And he makes the point that people have observed and many books have been written about him that they were all believers in God. And the wow. question comes up, is there a connection between belief in God and doing science? And the answer is, and it still is today, given by most people with nuances, that there's a very profound connection. Lewis mm. put it, as usual, brilliantly. He said, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature. Wow. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. And when I discovered that, I thought, this is wonderful because it's telling me that far from their belief in God hindering their science. It was their belief in God that drove their science. It was the motor that drove it, which is why I found your question, which is right at the heart of our, particularly our Western culture today, it's ironic that today people are saying science and God are incompatible when the very people they depended on, the real geniuses of science, hmm. all believed in God. And so Praise God for that. I find it very close-minded of an atheist to say that there is no faith in science and, and anything that is unexplainable or supernatural, they completely disregard it without even looking into it because they already have in their mind that that's not possible. And therefore, they don't go down that route. Therefore, that makes them way more close-minded than someone who is religious and who believes in God because they'll, they can expect anything. With God, all things are possible. Anything can happen. So they didn't see any inconsistency. Now, I learned that pretty young. And what it narrows down to is the very interesting fact that mathematics works. That mm. idea that math makes sense somehow that the world is under that, that that that's that the world of science is related to mathematical equations most lay people uh would never think about that and even when i have read about this concept in a newspaper article that some uh, mathematician or some scientist is marveling at the idea that the laws of nature can be understood and that they can be described by math, they, they seem to make it sound stunning, that, it that it's stunning. startling. But to lay people, 
it's almost as though we don't understand why it's stunning. In other words, we, maybe we associate math and science in such a way that we think, well, of course, it's got to be that that's way. That's right. That's right. But it took a really great mind to see it was stunning. Einstein. Albert Einstein said the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Wow. And he was clever enough to see there was an issue. Eugen Wigner, who also with Einstein won a Nobel Prize for Physics, he wrote a paper which is much loved by mathematicians in 1961 and he called it the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. The unreasonable yes. effectiveness. Yes, now that's very interesting. Yes. In other words, you shouldn't expect mathematics to work. Now, Richard <laughs> Feynman, the great American Nobel Prize winning physicist, said the same thing. It, it's just stunning that it actually works. Here is somebody, and she's a mathematician, and she's thinking in here about the universe out there, and she comes up with equations, and they describe what's out there. I, I mean, how does that possibly work? in such a way that it gives us power over these things. Newton, law of gravity and his laws of motion alone, without even Einstein's corrections, can help us send a person to the moon. How does that actually work? Wow. Now, what interested me, and this is a bit later on at university, I read Wigner's paper, I've read it several times. So Wigner wrote the paper as late as 61, you said? Yes, the unreasonable effectiveness. And I said, what do you mean unreasonable? What is the worldview that's driving that verdict? And that opened a whole world to me that wasn't apparent in terms of its significance until the last 10 years or so, when I saw how powerful it is. Because one of the things now that I say to people is my main reason for not being an atheist as a scientist is not that I'm a Christian. It's because I can do science. Because <laughs> the only thing that makes reasonable the effectiveness of mathematics is my faith in God. The fact that I think there is mathematics, the fact that there is everything is solved by a math equation points to a creator. Guys, if everything was just evolved by accident with no reason, no cause, no purpose, why would... Of course there wouldn't be any mathematics. Of course there wouldn't be any of that. None of that would make sense. None of this would, like, like when you look at mathematics and, and how everything just works perfectly and there's a design to it all, of course there's a creator. Just like when you look at a computer system, you see it and you realize, of course there was a creator behind that computer code. That's a very radical statement. It's a very radical and statement. And one almost never hears that statement, even from people speaking on the very subject uh, on which we're speaking. That, that, that you're saying that not only are science and God uh, compatible, you're saying, uh, no, in a way that's wrong. They're, they're not merely compatible. Science drives you to believe in God. That's uh, right. Let me make it even more provocative because I can tell that you're quite a provocative guy and I like it. <laughs> you see, let me put it this way. I feel, I think, and I believe there's evidence for the fact that faith in God and science sit very comfortably as they did in the minds of Galileo, Kepler and Newton. What doesn't fit together is science and atheism. I think that atheism undermines science for a reason mm. that is connected with the effectiveness of mathematics. So we should properly be challenging atheists far more than they challenge people of faith. Well, that's right. And I can unpack that a little bit, yeah. if you like, yeah. because it is a major mm. argument these days. You see, we have this trust as scientists, as mathematicians, in human reason. We rely on our human reason to get to our conclusions. Now, in the 1940s, C.S. Lewis was writing about this, and I think people didn't really grasp what he was saying. What he was saying is this. He said, any theory of mind that undermines the validity of human reason 
cannot be true because you reach that theory by reasoning. Okay. <laughs> okay. Again, this is another There's, heavy one. I want to pause. Yes, it's That's beautiful. A, these are big ideas, but they're very, very important ideas. Um, he, he, he phrased it in such a way, Lewis did, at some point, I can't remember the exact quote, but he says, if the universe made no sense, or uh, if the universe were absurd, if the universe made no sense, we should never have discovered that. We never would be able to discover that. That, that is part of it. That goes down to the root of it. And mm. the reason for it, and he put it brilliantly, but it wasn't in the center of the big debate, not to the extent it is today. Because what's happened in the last four or five years yeah. is that a very prominent atheist is beginning to use Lewis's arguments. And that has changed the balance completely. Really? And who is that? It's Thomas Nagel. In New York who, City? In New York City, NYU. that's right. That's right. But if you like, I'll backtrack a bit so that we can unpack this so that it makes a kind of sense. Yeah. Lewis is suggesting that if you undermine the validity of reason, your theory's wrong. Now, I'm suggesting that that's why Wigner said mathematics is unreasonably effective because his worldview, which was atheistic, followed to its logical conclusion, actually destroys rational thought. Yes. Now, <laughs> Let me put it in the form of a discussion I frequently have. I tease people, my fellow colleagues. They like being teased, you see. And I say to them, tell me what you do science with. And of course, if they're in the like my physical sciences, brain. they'll tell me about some very expensive piece or of equipment. Mind. They've got a billion dollars. I said, no, 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 I don't mean that. I mean, oh, they say. You mean my, and they're about to say mind when they remember it's not politically correct to say mind. So they I, say. I had no idea things have gotten to the point where it's no longer politically correct to say mind. Oh, yes, you've got to say brain. The mind is the brain because everything is physical, you oh, Okay, we, they, everything let's, can be reduced to physical. I was going to say, let, let's, 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 let's make sure that that's clear to the audience. Yes. Because this, this is. Yeah, the mind and the brain are. Two different things. The mind is something almost like your soul, almost like something outside of your brain because there's things happening all around and you just cognitively should not be able to realize that you are thinking, but you're thinking that you're thinking. That's that's like the mind, you know? Doesn't make any sense. It's a, an amazing idea. Uh, the idea that the mind is not the same as the brain. The idea that if we were only moist robots, as somebody disgustingly put it. <laughs> yeah, um, computing meat. Computing meat. If that were the case, um, then in effect, uh, anything like a computer ought to develop consciousness. But nothing that we ever know of except humans has consciousness. So the mind is separate from our mere brains. But it has gotten to the point, and I just wanted to annotate that or underscore that, that you're saying that in the world of science at Oxford, people are afraid to use the word mind because it implies that there's something beyond the physical material brain. Well, yes, that's right, but it's not all people. If we step back from this, let's put this in a bigger framework. What we're up against in the culture is the logical conclusion of a materialistic view of the universe. See, let's go back to Socrates and Plato because that will help make things clear. In the world of their time, about 300 BC or so, the Greeks were divided in their view of the big question. What is the nature of ultimate reality? Now, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle all believed in the gods. They believed there was something more mm. than the physical universe. But Democritus and Leucippus, who were geniuses, because they developed the atomic theory. And the atomic theory is one of the most important things ever discovered. Richard Feynman actually made a very interesting statement. He said, of all of science was lost, all of science was lost, but there was one result that we could preserve to pass 
to the next generation, just one, it would have to be the atomic theory. That everything is made of atoms. Now, atomos means indivisible. We know they're divisible, but the basic idea is there is stuff, very tiny stuff, and everything but everything is made of that stuff. But, now that how, how, but I have to say, as proud as I am to be a Greek, uh, the idea that someone in Greece in the fourth century, Democritus, came up with that idea, how in the world, without going into this too much, but how could they back then have come up with this idea? <laughs> well, by a brilliant piece of reasoning. They, they could take a piece of wood and they could cut it and it was smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And they reckoned there must be a point at which that process stops by something that couldn't be cut. And this is the basic stuff of reality. But then they made a leap that this would be all of reality. Now that view barrels up through the centuries and it sits in Oxford. Wow. It's in fact the dominant philosophy in Western academia. And we call it materialism. Now there's another version which we call naturalism. They're both atheistic. They both deny anything beyond, but some give a little bit more weight to the existence of mind that's independent of matter. Now, if you are a materialist, then you're going to say that when everything else is said, mind reduces to brain, that's all it is. Brain reduces to physics and chemistry, and all we are is physics and chemistry. Now, back to my little story, you see. Let's suppose that's true for a minute, and I say to my friends, tell me what you do science with. I do it with my brain. Tell me about your brain. I have great fun with this. I love it. <laughs> tell I can, me, tell I can me see about your brain. Go. What is the brain? Give me the short story. Well, the short story is the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I look at them and I smile and I say this, and, and you, you trust, trust it? it? <laughs> yep, and that's the crux. Shout out to John Lennox. What a blessing. So guys, be sure and know that you are created for a purpose. You are designed with tr intrinsic value. So I encourage you to go to Jesus today. Know that he loves you and he's longing to have a relationship with you. Put him first. It will be the best decision you could ever make. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. I encourage you to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't. And I'm trying to hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And I know we could do it with your help. So thank you so much for all the love and support. It means the world. Have an amazing day and God bless.